Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Commissioner. I have a follow-up on the same two concerns that Mr. Bracero raised. Okay. First, with reference to your budget. The monies that uh, finance your budget are from taxes that have already been paid and are being paid. Those taxes are not going down. It's a question of whether we provide the resources to Social Security to effectively and efficiently provide the services that, that a worker who has the misfortune of uh, disability would expect. And uh, you mentioned some goals on appeals, for example. Is it correct that currently that you do not have the resources to replace Social Security Administration employees who retire or depart to another job? As a general matter, uh, Mr. Doggy, yes, that's correct. We've, um, we've got a hiring freeze in place with some very limited exceptions that relate to backlog um, reduction. And in, in addition, we have, and I'll give you the, f the exact number for the record, probably uh, slightly over a thousand employees that basically we're waiting to see what happens with sequestration. We've gone up to the the one percent statutory limit, um, more or less, on the um, retired annuitants. Um, we've also, to the extent that we've made exceptions in the hiring, over a lot of objections from some of my people, I have said the people that have been with us the longest, that's where our obligation is first. So the extent that we've done hiring in the last six months, it's been temporary. So that if we have um, a deep cut under sequestration, we will let those people go and take less out of the people that have been working for us for 20, 30 years. So we've got a large group of people who are hanging in the balance waiting to see what happens with sequestration. And while you, your oral testimony referred to the significant progress you've made in reducing the backlog on the time that an appeal takes, those numbers are beginning to trend back up, aren't they? In recent months, they've gone up from the low that you talked about last October? S slightly. I mean, I think statistically I would call it approximately level, and there is some wobble. We. I'm, and sw the, the I'm swearing in 40 judges tomorrow, and we've got some more coming. So I, I think that by the end of the year, we'll, there's a good chance that we'll be essentially level for most of the is year. Is it unlikely that you can meet your objective of 270 days unless your budget is fully funded? Yes. There, there are a couple. So let me, let me be totally forthcoming. I think we were making extremely good progress on the 270. There were doubters. So Congress asked GAO to do an and they gave us a 78 percent probability a couple of years ago of hitting it. I, I'll be honest with you. It's very unlikely we're going to hit the 270 on time now. And it's, it's a combination of the recession, timely judges from OPM, and funding for staff. Right. I'm doing all I can on each of those three things, but those are the critical factors well, for how close we Let me turn to the second come. concern, and that's the question uh, of the change that was made last December so that someone who's coming to bring a, uh, an appeal can find out if who the judge is. Right. And, and I've been a judge before coming to Congress, and I've also been a litigator, and it was always important to me whether I was bringing a claim or defending a claim to know who I would be presenting that claim to. As it relates to in-person conferences, not video conferences, uh, is there any good reason why the practice that Social Security has followed in the past of letting someone know before they walk in the hearing room who the judge is, why that ought not to be uh, continued? Yes. So I, I think, in fact, it, it embodies a fairly important principle of justice. And again, I think if we had realized the extent to which a random assignment was being manipulated, we would have acted sooner. And that's because when you have as much manipulation as we're concerned that we have, the consequence of that is that the 15 percent of the claimants who are not represented are, by definition, getting the stingiest justice, uh, judges. And I don't think, I mean, these tend to be the people who are the least sophisticated. Well, if it they is tend to fact, be the people who are most impoverished. And I don't know how you can say If it is, in fact, random assignment, why can't you announce who the judge is before you walk in the room? But, Mr. Dwight, it's not random assignment. What, what, what we have discovered is that claim, claimants' reps have found a number of ways to manipulate the system, and that the principle of, of random assignment has been violated in any of number of ways. This is why it's taking us so long to come up with a fix. It's not just the video hearings. It's not just um, you know the particular problem we had at Huntington and those. Guys. It, as we've 
dug into this, there are a variety of problems around the system that come from non-random, you know, random assignment being violated. And what we're trying to do is get a handle on that as best we can with a permanent solution. But in the meantime, I don't think it's fair or appropriate that the people who are, as a general matter, on the bottom end of the spectrum get the judges that are least likely to award them benefits. I just don't, I mean, I, I, we're supposed to be representing these people too. Um, and that's what judges are supposed to do when they come into hearings. They're not supposed well, I, to be. I hope you'll supplement the record on specifically what, if there is random assignment, specifically what has occurred that you can't resolve in some other way than denying an opportunity to find out who the judge is before you walk in the room. And on video conferences sure. specifically, so long as there is agreement that if you agree to a video conference, you get the judge that's assigned in the video conference. What's wrong with that? If you would allow a friendly amendment to your request, sure. what I'd like to do is come up and brief staff because several of these issues that have come up which are not public have or potentially have a law enforcement okay. dimension to them. So I'd rather not lay that out in the record. And I'd also rather not, to the extent that we're being defrauded or the system's being abused, I'd rather not lay out publicly how it's done as a roadmap for others to not. do it until we can do it. So what I would like to do, and hopefully we can do this on a friendly bipartisan basis with the majority and minority staff, is come up and go through some of these other things that we've come across that have given us the basis for significant concern. Thank you. There's a little bit of manipulation among the law firms, too, that represent some of those people that they're in it for money. Uh, I think that's more on the video. That's not on the video. Yeah, yeah. And, that, and that's why I, cause he really didn't respond on the video part. Yeah. If you agree to a video hearing and you get whatever judge is to be assigned at random from one of the national centers, why isn't that sufficient protection on video? Well, because under the, the current rules, um, you, you're allowed to manipulate and pick and choose. You're, you can see who you get on the video and then you can decide but to you, decline. But if you're restricted and you get your, own, your only choice, you change it and your only choice is to get the judge assigned we, to the video, we're, why we're, isn't that sufficient? Well, we're looking, we're, we're looking exactly at doing that, but my, I believe that my at least interim advice from general counsel is I need to do that through notice and comment rulemaking. The other thing, again, without compromising what's happening. The other technique, and I am I'm concerned also about this on some other levels from a claimant's perspective, is that a number of reps have gotten into the practice of simply withdrawing an appeal and then refiling. And that's another way in which random assignment has been manipulated in some part. And some of this is our fault. Some of this, you know, I don't know that we've been entirely consistent even in implying our own rules. So it's a difficult problem. It's an important principle of justice to get this right. We're trying to take the time to do this right. In the interim, I think what we're doing, we acknowledge it's not perfect, and we have not represented that we want to continue to do it in depth. I'd be delighted to go back to telling people who the judge is. I don't think it's, I think the criticism is a little bit overwrought in that you know, it's the same DA, NLRB, I don't believe you get notice of judge. Most workers comp, you don't get notice. I, too, was a trial attorney in my reckless youth. The, in the Massachusetts Superior Court, at least in 1985, when I tried my first case, you didn't know who your trial judge was until you walked in, and then it changed on a monthly basis. So, you know, you couldn't really design a case for the predilections of a judge because the judge would change multiple times over the course of the trial. So, again, I'm not defending what we're doing, and I've been, I think, straightforward. I don't want to continue. I'd be perfectly well, happy that. to put the judge's name back on, but I don't want to do it until I fix things that are important for the integrity of the system.